the law, which is the system that we are under here in America, mm -hmm. but he's also very knowledgeable on ancient law uh, and on Moorish history. Um, so without any further ado, um, I want to turn it <laughs> over to our speaker for the night. We've been talking about topics that we would try to cover. True. And so uh, I'm going <coughs> to let Brother Kometi you lay out tonight's lecture for you. We're going to do it in two parts. Uh, we're going to do part one tonight and part two next week. So let's give Brother Kometi you a hand. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> good evening. Good evening. Um, me and Minister Brown was um, dialoguing over the phone in reference to a topic, in reference to religion. And, um, and I was bringing some very enlightening information to him about the fact that a lot of our people don't realize that the way the system is set up today, it started from that foundation. Um, Next week, I'm going to bring more material in so that way I can get into uh, in-depth um, reference because that's important to see the references where I'm drawing insight from, all right, so we can have a clear uh, basis of how we should see the global structure and takeover through the religious sector and that religious sector uh, empire of course, was started with Rome. Um, it was an issue where, and when I say started for, with Rome, I mean to a point where this is where the quote unquote European have taken over. But the foundation of the Roman religion or faith, of course, was of an African people. It was an African base. Um, it started with the, what you call as the Hagia Sophia, all right, which we know today is modern Turkey, all right. But where it came from was from ancient Egypt, um, the Coptic Egyptians, all right, the Malachite Coptic Egyptians was the basis of the Hagia Sophia that was, of course, established in what we know today as Turkey, all right. Um, matter of fact, that same location was the location where we would know today as the Byzantine Empire, all right. This is before. Um, it got hit in 1453 um, under the Islamic regime. But prior to it getting hit, that Byzantine Empire was the empire that was the split from Rome because at first it was dealing with the Caesars. And um, er um, earlier, uh, prior to this lecture, I was just hearing the discussion of the audience and they was talking about how we don't have African Americans in the Senate. And we need to analyze the basis and the origin of that, all right, because that's the foundation also that comes from that religious base, because the Senate is a, a, a Roman a official status or title, all right, and so the Senate actually represents the fascism of Rome, all right, and it's very important that people know these things because we as a people, we have a tendency to not really know the history of these political statuses that we get into, all right? One of the problems that I notice is that when we get into these positions, we don't seem to push forward our agenda as a people. It's like we seem to forgot, you know, as they say, the eyes on the prize. We don't push forward to be able to fully liberate our people from the incarceration of a system that keeps us still up under what you call Jim Crowism. Jim Crow still today ex exists, all right? But that form of system came from the religious facet, all right? Um, we can draw references like, for instance, in the book of Exodus, the 21st chapter, verse 1 through 6, all right? It talks about servitude, servitude in reference to a Hebrew slave, all right? But we may say the Hebrew slave, but who is actually the slave? And that condition that was being pressed upon us was us as a people, all right? Because it seems like we're talking about the Hebrew people 
when we read the scripture, but we don't realize that that information is codified. Because when you study the um, verses 1 through 6, very diligently, you will find out that in 1 through 6, it talks about how when a man comes in without a wife, all right, and he comes in freely by himself, he can leave freely by himself. If he comes in and he gets a wife through one of the slave masters, and he bears ch children, which is sons and daughters of that woman, and he chooses to leave with his wife and his children, he would leave by himself, but the wife and the children would stay with the slave master. This is actually in Exodus the 20, first chapter, verse 1 through 6. Why I'm referencing this information so you'll be very clear what's going on is because that information has been codified within the state. The state is actually the slave master, all right? Because the question is, why would the slave master give the free man, the so-called black man, a wife, and then when he bears children, when it's time to leave, he himself can leave freely, but the wife and the children cannot leave because why? The condition that was put upon the woman and her child under the slave master, meaning that the woman and the child is his property. So the only thing that the brother did was bear children for the slave master. But that slave master today, again, is the state, all right? Because what they did is they codified the ecclesiastical law into the civil law. And the civil law was codified into the criminal law, all right? So again, it's so important to really recognize how they took the religious facet, you know, and in incorporated or codified that into a civil law, all right? Because what happens is that for so many generations that went by us and the brainwashing and the enslavement and the abuse and the torture and the dehumanization process that was going on at that particular time made us far-fetched moved away from the realities so that way we won't actually see this pain and this suffering in reference to the process. The process is still going on today. We as a people are not clear about the process. We know that there's pain and suffering, that we're going through something, but we don't really acknowledge why we're going through it because, again, the system was set up through a religious facet. Of course, me and Mr. Brown was talking earlier and one thing that he has said to me, which is very true, that the African was the basis of the religious sector. But because of the fact that the imaging was so powerful from the African, that the Romans wanted to break that image. That was something that the Greeks couldn't get away from. Because the Greeks, when they were in ancient Kemet, into our spiritual system, only thing that the Greeks did was Hellenize everything that was Egyptian. So technically, the Egyptian or the Greek language, I should say, is nothing but a corruption of ancient Egyptian language. That's all it is. They just Hellenized or changed or modified what was Egyptian and made it appear though it was Greek. Because the Greek was so infatuated with our powerful images, precepts, and concepts of our spirituality. So... And, and that's something different from religion now, because religion is totally different in reference to the spirituality of what our ancestors have. So that needs to be clear. But once that spirituality, the principalities of that spirituality was passed down, and when the Romans seen that, they're the ones who actually changed that. All right? They're the ones who came with that concept of monotheism, all right? which means they wanted to be the one who dominate and have the only one true God. That's what that whole concept of monotheism came in. Not to say that we didn't have that concept, but our concept was with the oneness of God. All right, we have the multi facets, but at the same time, we've seen the unison of one. All right, the Romans didn't see that. All right, they wanted control. They wanted you not to see the multi facets of, 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 of the Creator. He just wanted you to see that one icon and image. <clears throat> Excuse me. So again, by the Romans taking over and developing their own or making and molding their own base in reference to a religious system, all right, 
they was taking that as a weapon and was breaking the spirituality of the African. This is exactly what the Romans was doing. So when you study the history, you'll come to find out that millions of Africans who were, as we would say, Christians, not Catholic, Christians were being slaughtered more in the amphitheater than in the Roman Colosseum because of their spirituality. All right, so again, when they finally got to break the African, all right, Rome started to flourish, but there was a problem in Rome because that religious sector was the sector that the Senate of Rome were not in agreement with. The Caesar in Rome that was not in agreement with. That right there caused the division in Rome. And that's when Rome split into two and had the, the Byzantine Empire, all right, which was the eastern part of where Rome's second empire started to flourish. Now, if you notice that Rome decayed, she fell, she fell down because of the dramatic tribes going into Rome and the war broke out and Rome had lost its power. But the religious facet of Rome under the papal or the papacy, that empowerment flourished. It went out. It went out so much that all of Europe and all the sovereigns were, as we would say today, was Catholic. All right? There was a big stronghold for a long period of time in reference to the church. And there was also a conflict with that power struggle because the sovereigns or the kings of Europe wanted to control the masses of people under their own monarch. So there was a breaking away of the Catholic Church and that's when the Protestant movement started to come in. And of course they was giving Martin Luther the credit for the Protestant movement, but technically it was really the Moors. The Moors were the one, which is us, all right, because that's something that we need to get clear because we as a people really don't know our history. A lot of our history is written in a lot of European books and of course they can't get away from our history because our history talks about them. But they use our history to talk about themselves but they have really have cut out a lot of our history that reflect us to a point where they even start changing the images because one of the issues that I've noticed and I read in um, the introduction of John G. Jackson I mean, excuse me, the introduction of African civilization by John G. Jackson, excuse me, where he showed you that, the, that there was references that Moors were Caucasians, all right? Chancellor Williams also shows that, and of course our Afrocentric scholars had refuted that to show that the Moors were of what you call black-skinned people, all right? It's not technically a term that I normally would use <clears throat> because me being an etymologist, I study language. This is something that I, um, I push towards our people because language is really the correct um, science that we really, really need to look at because even though we may talk about history in time, one of the things that we have to look at when it comes to history is the language, all right? There's a book in my presence um, it's called Webster's New World College Dictionary, all right, third edition. And most of us today don't even really know how to read a dictionary, let alone an etymology dictionary, because we was never raised in the school system to read a dictionary, all right? And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because there are languages in this dictionary that refers to a certain word. All right, so, and it's very important for me to bring this out because it's kind of difficult to bring a presentation to people who are not really familiar with the language. So when I start using languages, I start articulating what it is, it kind of like far-fetched. So it's almost like I have to take time and really break it down. I wish I had a board because one of the things that I like to do when I do lecture is I like to break things down on the board because that's what you call epistemology which means how we know knowledge, by signs, symbols, rhythms, all right? So what happened is, as one speak, right, and you have the visualization, as one speak, you can actually observe what you're seeing. That's epistemology, because then what you're doing is you're giving critical analysis of what you hear and what you see, and you're equating the two. You see what I'm saying? So that's important, because really to get into the real 
uh, truth about our history, language is a factor. Listen to this, and you'll need to hear this, because it's very important. We cannot talk about our history through the eyes of English-speaking people. Do you hear me what I'm saying, y'all? We cannot talk about our history through the eyes of the French-speaking people. Do you hear me what I'm saying, y'all? We cannot talk about our history through an Arabic-speaking people. That's very important because that's the poison and the confusion that we are faced with. So it's very difficult for me, really, to express the historical origin of our history truly as, uh, about us as a people. Um, I have been raised in the school of thought by Afrocentric teachers, and I respect every single last one of them. But one thing that they have to stress was that language. Because what happened is, if we don't stress that language, we're not going to get to the true basis of it. I'm doing some research and coming to find out that now there's a website um, that's, putting, that's being put out about African dictionaries. All right? This is something that Malefe Asante was pushing with Ebonics, with the book called The Afrocentric Idea. And I've studied his book, all right, because, again, I'm into epistemology. All right? I study the origins of words. All right, which is important because comprehending the study and the origin, true origin of the words, show you truly that it goes back to us. All right, there's two words that we need to really look at when it talks about our language, when it talks about history, because it's impossible to talk about the African history without talking about the language. The culture itself, the very epitome of the African culture, is actually within the heart of the language. All right, so if you remove the language from the people, you're actually removing the very epitome of our, uh, as Donna Richards said, Utamawazo, our worldview. All right, so even she had used some expressive terms in African dialect. You see what I'm saying? Even like when we use the word Kwanzaa. Kwanzaa is first fruit. Now, it's so interesting, now listen to me carefully, that we would go to church and we are here, the pastor or the minister, talk about giving your first fruit. To God, not knowing that the very concept, the first fruit, comes from our culture. So when you start studying the Bible, you start beginning to see, if you study the language and know the language, there's a lot of African culture right in the Bible. And I don't hear ministers and pastors talk about our culture as African people right in that Bible. I don't care how much distorted, how many times they've written it over. I'm telling you, when you study etymology, you can see our culture, the very epitome, is at the heart of that Bible, all right? I'm going to be the first one to tell you, and no one else told you this. And the only reason why I can tell you this is because I've studied the language, all right? Canaanite language is an African language. Do you hear me what I'm telling? And I can prove it to you, right, from the scriptures. And I have never heard nobody said that the African languages are Canaanite, all right? Um, they don't tell you that the Hebrew languages are, are, are African languages, or any so-called Semitic languages are African languages. Because why? Because of the front that they say that this is the Jewish language. Well, if the Jews is going to claim it, we're going to have to say, well, it's an African language that you're trying to claim for yourselves. And we can prove that it's an African language. And that's important, because why? In that language is a history that talks about us. So when you put the language to the forefront, on the table, between two people, you know, Caucasians and the African, all right, or the albino, or, the, or what they call it, the melanocroid, because melanocroid is actually the, the name for them, the medical name for them in reference to their losing the melanin factor in their skin. So when you got the African and the melanocroid sitting at the table and you, and you let the language be the base between the two and study the origin and the true history of the words of that language is going to reflect the very culture of our people. That's what it's going to show us. You see what I'm saying? So it's so important to express the language. So again, um, I'm realizing and recognizing that I'm going into a history in reference to the religious factor, but at the same time, language is very important to express first because language is really should be the introduction to anybody's lecture. Anybody's lecture, because why? If we don't show the basis of the language and origin, showing how that is African based, we lose. The, we, lo we lose. Because there's no way that we could be sitting up with European scholars and they're giving their arguments 
in debate of what we're saying that's Afrocentric, and then the basis of the whole argument don't be about language. The very African, I mean, the very European languages are African. I have not heard any of our scholars say that. And I'm not knocking our scholars, but I'm going to be the first to tell you that the very basis of the European languages are African-based. Even though it's modified or changed or diversified, it's still African because they could not speak without us. It was, the, it was our mother who had given the world its first language. And I've heard people talk about what was the first language. I hear people say Hebrew was the first language. I heard some people say Arabic was the first language. And I'll be the first to tell you it was Meduneta. All right? Meduneta meaning Mother Nature. All right? That was the first language. Because once you see nature and you see it, you express the words that you see in nature. And because of the fact that we was the first people of this world and no other people was around, we got to express that first. Grace was bestowed upon us as a people that we can express the very things that we see in nature. And because of that, we begin to start developing high culture, not civilization. Not civilization, because when you look up the word civilization, that's a process, bringing people from a criminal state of mind into something civil. So we was never civilized as a people. We was highly cultured. That's why it's important to express the language. Because once you begin to start to express the language, then you can kill a lot of the debates that I hear that we as a people go through with Europeans. If we sit down with European Jews, because they themselves would say that the Ethiopian Hebrews speak a pure Hebrew than they do. How is it that they can admit to that? Because of the fact that it's African. But they're not going to say it's African. They're not going to say it's Kometic, right? Which they say Hermetic, all right? They're going to say it's Semitic. But even if you say it's Semitic, Sim is the son of Ham. Do you hear me what I'm saying? Shem is the son of Ham. They're all family. So there's no possible way you're going to give me three different branches of the family and not say that they're all not related. So this whole concept of dividing them up was a German idea. All right? His name is Carl Linnaeus. He is actually the concept of racism. He's the racist. Racist meaning he studied the anthropology of man and to divide man up in these three different sectors. And that very anthropology was a concept that they actually incorporated into the religious sector. And so we, as a people, took that belief system that was really a dramatic teaching, thinking that it's Christian or biblical texts. That's what we did. So what they did was they said that the Hamites was the Negroids, which we all familiar with. They're going to say that the Semitic people are the, the Mongoloids, and the Japhetic people is, the, of course, the Caucasians and the Caucasoids. But that's not true. That's not true. So again, that whole concept was taken and incorporated into the biblical text. All right? So there was a lot of religious connotation that was being used where they incorporated their religious, religious and racist ideas into the religious texts, and then here we as a people reading these racist texts and don't realize it. Like one of the texts is in the book, uh, in, 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 um, in, in the Tanakh, which is the five books of Moses, it says in order for you to be a priest, you can't even have a, a, a deformity like a flat nose. The flat nose that they're referring to was African people, because they know that our nose was broad. But in other biblical texts, like the New International Version, they changed it. Other versions of the Bible, they changed because why? They don't want you to see the truth of the racist influences into the biblical text. This is what they didn't want you to see. So again, what am I stressing? Language. We're not looking at language. Most of us don't even realize the very word read. What does that define? What does that mean? It means to interpret. So when we read something, as they say, 
Are we reading it for a face value or on the surface? Or are we actually interpreting it every word we look at? It? We don't see, we have never been taught how to properly read. So we read connotatively, and, and it makes sense because who is teaching us how to read? Come on, y'all, we know our history. Because it was a time where we was not allowed to read and write. It, is, it, it doesn't mean that we couldn't read and write. It didn't mean that we couldn't read and write our own languages. We was not allowed to read and write those our own languages. We was not allowed to practice our own faith, be it Vudam or whatever it was at the particular time. We were not allowed to because they were structuring and making and molding us into being into bondage. This is what they were doing. So again, they was controlling us. It was controlling us. So now they're allowing us to read and write. So now we never question that. We never say, wow, one part of the history, they didn't want us to allow us to read it and write. They get it, if you get caught with a book, you got whipped to death almost. Now all of a sudden, they're pushing the textbook. You don't send your child to school, they're going to send the state after you and take your child away saying educational neglect. So what kind of games they're playing with us? that you didn't want us to read one moment, and then you're saying that we neglected our children the next moment. So there seems to be a shift. But why, would, why the shift? Because language is the key. It's the key. If we're going to truly want to unlock history, we must use the words in its origin, in its true origin. Like, for instance, I give an example. The UNIA with Marcus Garvey. He regretted using the word Negro. Garvey had said, in the, the philosophy and opinions, right, that when he left Jamaica and started the UNIA here in these United States and went back to Jamaica to start a chapter of the UNIA in Jamaica, he was not accepted. Why? Because Garvey said he never knew that there was racism in Jamaica until he left Jamaica and went back into Jamaica because the Jamaicans didn't see themselves as a Negro. They see themselves either as colored or white. All right? Because the colored was the raping of our women by these melanocroids, right? Lightening up our race of people. All right? So, because of that factor, the light skin had to be called colored. Unfortunately, the NAACP was the organization that condoned that movement. That was the boule bourgeois movement. That was the movement that Garvey was knocking. All right? But unfortunately, the NAACP movement and the Garvey movement was wrong. Because we were not Negroes, blacks, or coloreds. I'm stressing that factor because, again, what am I talking about, y'all? Language. Because when you go back to Africa, ancient Africa, not modern day Africa, because they poison our brothers and sisters with that crap over there too. All right? They, they poison it with that. Because I brought a book tonight so you know what's going on. It's called Apartheid. Excuse me. It's called Apartheid. Right? after apartheid, the solution for South Africa. And of course you see the colored children walking with the white children. Most of us would say, oh no, those are black children holding hands with white children. That's what we would say. But in that system, they wouldn't say black children because black children couldn't hold the hands of white children. They would say colored children are holding the hands of white children because of the, the mixing factor, all right? So this is something that we need to know, all right? So what they did here, they did over there too, all right? So they poisoned them over there. Why? Because they want to make sure that we don't go back to our African, uh, ancient languages. The Africans are even neglecting their own languages and getting involved with the European languages like French and English. Because if you notice that when you go among the African brothers and sisters, why are they walking around with European names? When I come in contact with an African, I says, what is your African name? Don't tell me your name is Marsha Lewis when I know you come from Ghana. You know, I know you've been colonized too, just like we've been colonized, but you have not got hit as hard as we got hit. Because one thing that you'll still maintain over there is your Africanness. 
even though you've been colonized, the epitome of the African culture is still there strong. All right, and we see it. We can go there and travel and we can see it. But at the same time, what is it with this African that want to take on the name of a European and come here to just assimilate and to be a part of the system? You know, what is that all about? The problem is, is that we are not communicating. We're not talking to them. They're not talking to us. And you know what is the most interesting thing that we don't say, that I notice? Maybe we do notice it, but I don't hear us talking about it. I have never really heard about the Africans talk about the slave trade or what happened. Are you, are you aware of that? Have you, if any, if you've been around Africans, have you really have heard an African talk about it? And those Africans fly over here and they're getting nursing jobs or whatever, they're driving cabs. And of course, we among our brothers and sisters. You see what I'm saying? But I've never really heard them talk about the conditions of what happened to us. And I'm saying this is incredible. This is incredible. So, you know, I have African friends, and I told them that I'm an African, all right? They don't see me as an African, but I told them, listen, I would never tell them that I'm African descent. Do you hear me what I'm saying? I would never tell them I'm an African descent. I am an African, all right? Because when you study the words, this D-E, that's why I like to use a board, because I want you to see the words. D-E means down. I have not descended down from Africans. I am African. Because when you say you're descended down from Africa, it's like saying we are subgroup. This is what the European was saying, that anything below the equator was sub-Africa. Anything was north, those are the ones who they was calling white. This is what they was doing in their history books. So again, what am I talking about? Looking at the language, studying the syntax of what they're using, to continue the racism and the apartheid system, the, the Jim Crow black hole system. This is, and they're still doing this today. Our people should not be calling themselves Negroes, blacks, and coloreds. Those are not African words. If you study the history of the word black, you'll come to find out that that word black was not even the word they used among the English. Now, even among the German tribes, they used the word Swartz. They didn't use the word black. So how did they come about this word black? That's the question. Did we ever look to the word black? A lot of our brothers will say black power. But do they really know what they're empowering? We don't really know no language. But we're getting ourselves into a movement and labeling ourselves for the same depression and pogrom that was created for us by the European. So I always say, wait a minute, if we use the word black, well, what difference is the word black than the N-word? Because if the brothers are using the N-word in a positive way, but well, guess what? We're using the word black in a positive way, not knowing that black is being used at a, as a connotative term that was put onto our people as a weapon. It was to what? Dehumanize us. So have we ever learned that the word black was a dehumanizing word, um, term? Malcolm stressed it best when he said in the mo movie Malcolm X, when he opens up the dictionary and he sees uh, dirty, soil, gloomy, and when white, he looks at what? Pure, clean. So what is that telling you? Whose language is that? Are we saying, oh, what's the language label of that word? Where it's coming from? And why are we associating that word? with ourselves, but at the same time, we as a people say, wow, it's just a shame that our brothers are using the N-word among themselves. Not knowing that black is like using the N-word among ourselves and not knowing it. And not knowing it. So again, the Africans, and even in the Caribbean, they don't use that word black, Negro, and colored. They really don't use that word. If you, when a brother from the Caribbean come, and you say where they're from, they, they say the nation state from where they come from. Same thing with Africa. They don't say, oh, I'm, I'm black and I'm from Jamaica. They don't say I'm black and I'm from Trinidad. They don't say that. They say, oh, I'm from Trinidad. So how is it that in their worldview that they don't equate the word black? And then all of a sudden when they come around us, we feel that they don't feel that they're black. 
We feel that way. So the question is, why they don't feel the way we feel? Because the oppression is different. The oppression is different. We have different oppressions. We, the problem that we have as a people is that we don't understand or comprehend our oppression. The oppression is definitely dehumanizing, but there's different forms of oppression. So what they do to our brothers and sisters in the Caribbean is something different than what they did in Africa, which is something they did different here in America. So now the oppression is different. So we don't recognize each other's oppression. But if we were to recognize each other's oppression, you know what would happen? We would pull together. Excuse me. We would actually pull together if we recognize each other's oppression. You see what I'm saying? And we don't recognize each other's oppression because if we did, our brothers and sisters would come to us because we paved the way. We paved the way in this country. We made and mold this country. I had did some research, historical research, to come to find out that during the time of the transatlantic trading or human trafficking is what I really call it, because it's not really slave, because the word slave means Slavic, and we're not a Slavic people. I come to find out that when they had gathered and captured our people and bring us here, the languages that we spoke were all Bantu languages. There were various different languages, but it's all Bantu. Over two-thirds of Africa is Bantu. You can talk to any one of them. The Nigerian, the people from Ghana, you know, Vi from Liberia, you can tell them it's all Bantu languages. And it's interesting because we have family from down south like the Carolinas and Georgia, and of course we speak Kichi, which is the Gullah. I didn't know until I did the research that that's all Bantu languages. My wife, being from um, Guyana, we was talking one day. We was chit-chatting, and all of a sudden, she was telling me that her aunt was annoyed with her because she should be speaking several different languages, something that we don't do. But over there, they do. But as a little girl, for some reason, she wasn't interested in it. So she was just stuck with English. But she does know a few words like in Patois and Creole, and then I also learned that she knew Geechee. So that threw me to the floor. I'm saying, what? Geechee? Now, we would never think that somebody in Guyana would be speaking Geechee, because we always associate Geechee where? In the Carolinas or Georgia. So that was interesting to me. I said, wow. So she actually went to the website and pulled up in Guyana, Geechee as one of the languages. I'm saying, whoa, we're not relating. We're not communicating. So if we communicate with each other, we can make the connection. We don't need no Ancestry.com, if you know what I'm talking about, to find our DNA to see uh, we link to Africans. We don't, need, we don't need to pay these people money for DNA to see if we are Africans. We can just look in the mirror and see that we're Africans. Only thing we need to do is begin to start talking to each other, relating to each other. Because we begin to start putting the pieces together ourselves. We don't need Europeans to come up with this Ancestry.com website to say if we take your DNA, we can tell you what tribe you're from. You know? We, wouldn't, we don't need that. You know, our spirit and soul is so strong with wisdom that there's times that we, when we look at each other, we, we, we'll say, wow, you know, he looked like he could have been from this tribe or that tribe. You know, we, we say that among ourselves, but we don't push it or enhance it as much as we should so we can unlock our liberation because the true liberation of our people is going back to the African languages. I'm going to be the first to tell you that. The true liberation of our people is going back. It's sad that the African brothers and sisters are leaving their languages to speak a European language for economic reasons. Well, we should be putting the economics into our language. So then you know what happens? You kill your language. Because if your language doesn't have anything economically going on, then your language is useful. It's useless. It's worthless. So again, when we want to express the history, when we start talking about the church and Rome and the papacy, we have to begin to start looking at the language, how it was developed, not knowing that the first five kings of Rome were Africans. So the very basis 
of the Roman faith was an African base. So how would it wind up being a weapon towards us when it was African? After a while, repetitious studies from different scholars, Europeans and Africans alike, start telling me, but wow, you know what it sounded like to me? It sounded like Africans were fighting Africans. That's what it seemed like to me because I can't fathom a small group of Europeans overthrowing an entire continent. I can't fathom it. So how do we wind up in this condition? Then I start realizing we had problems among ourselves. It was easy for them to overthrow us because if I had beef with you and that's the enemy over there, I will capture you and your family and sell you to the enemy over there. And this is how it happened. We really, as a people, conquered ourselves. And the only way we're going to get back our greatness is it has to come from us. And we have to start with the language. So if we want to unlock the history of our people, and usually the word history is not what I really like to use. I, uh, the word really is heritage. You hear the word H-E-R, her. Because truly, we are from a matriarchal society. Because what they did is they self-imposed that story, that masculine, male-dominant story as a pass onto us, as a story unto us. They took their history and overlaid our heritage with their history. So technically, we have a heritage as a people. Because like I said, again, words or the language is very important to express. All right, and that's important to know these things. Again, there are materials that you can look into. I um, referenced the Webster's Newark College Dictionary, third or fourth edition, because when you go to the etymology brackets, you'll see different language labels. You'll see Middle English, you'll see Old English, you see Old French. You'll see Latin, you'll see Hebrew, you'll see Greek. Then you'll see the IE base, what they call is Sanskrit. All right? What is that telling you? How come we don't see it from our perspective? When I teach etymology and we talk about the entry word of a dictionary, right after the entry word, they call it the phonetic brackets. How many of us recognize when you hear the word phonetic bracket, that word phonetic goes back to the Phoenician? The Phoenicians are who? An African people. That's still talking about us. So it's interesting that they say the phonetic bracket. They put our history, as they say, or our heritage in the book. We're looking at our, our heritage in the book, not seeing it because of the way they got us connotatively reading. So again, if we're going to look at history, we got to start with breaking down the language, comprehending the origin of the language so we can see are we really putting it in, in its proper perspective. Tuesday night, I give law classes in Harlem at the National Black Theater between 6.30 and 9.30. I was telling the students there because we was teaching law and I'm using law terms. The first three Tuesdays, I'm teaching language. We can't put motion pleadings together. We can't put affidavits or writs together without the language. So I was stressing language. Because when we stand up before that judge or that prosecutor and we don't know the language, the first thing they're going to say is, you need an attorney. Because why? He went to school to become a what? Wordsmith. That's what he went to school for. Because he played on words. Yesterday I was with a Moore who won his case. His wife was sitting on the stand giving her statement as her being a witness to her husband being jumped by some, some security officers. And what was the most beautiful thing that you would ever want to see is when she was giving her statement. She has an African accent. She's from Ghana. But of course, she has a British English, which is different from an American English. And this is something that you need to know. You will need to know this. Because if, we, if we're not going to recognize this history if we don't study this language. When the prosecutor started questioning her of course, he's using an English syntax that we're all familiar with. When she responded back to him, she responded to him 
of course, what she knows is a British English. The syntax of the British English is different. When he heard her response, he didn't even know how to respond to her. He had a difficult time trying to create an English American syntax to cross examine her in a way where she can give him back an answer that he's looking for. But because her response is, is from a British syntax, it was just thrown off the prosecutor because he, it was to a point where he's just started making up stuff just to get the, just to get the, you know, the trial going. It was incredible. It was incredible. It was incredible. And again, what I'm talking about, the language. When I seen that actually live that took place yesterday, I have a book called American Language, The History of American Language. In the footnotes, it was talking about Webster. What threw me to the floor was Webster was a rebel against the crown. Why? Because he was putting down or making note that they did not want the American people to use usage and customs of British syntax. That's why he came up with the Webster's Dictionary. Benjamin Franklin sent his children to Webster's school because Webster was saying that when the school system was being set up here as parishes, right, they were sending British textbooks here. And who fought against that was Webster. The United States is the only country that speaks English and that's not subject to the British syntax. The Caribbean is and Africa is. And it's so interesting to see that. Because, and the thing that disturbs me the most, listen to this carefully, and you've probably heard of this, where you hear a brother from the Caribbean or even an African would say, you know, our English is a better English than your English. I said, wait a minute, then what happened to the African language? How are you going to prop the oppressor's language over the other oppressor's language and disregard your language? His language can never be better than an African language. But you turn around and disregard your language and gave praise worthy to his language. And you're wondering why we're having problems. I said to myself, that's incredible. So again, the order to really unlock history, like for instance, I'll give you an example. In the story of the Moors in Spain by Stan Elaine Poole, in his book, he talks about Christians and Moors. Now let's analyze that language. When you hear the word Christians and Moors, you hear something religious, right? Come on, y'all, you hear something religious. So would you think that a Moor is somebody religious, or you think that that's his nationality? Technically, it's his nationality, but it has a religious connotation to it because they're associating the Moors with the Christian. So you'll think it's one religious group fighting over another religious group. So why is Stanley Lane Poole saying Christians and Moors? Why he's not saying Europeans and Moors? He's putting, he, listen, what I'm saying, when you read J.A. Rogers' book, and he talks about St. Maurice, the Moor. He was the defender of the faith. He's a Moor and he's a Christian. Do you hear me what I'm saying? So look at the language how Stanley Lane Poole was using. The, the time period that he wrote the book was in 1886. So now we're talking about from a British syntax. Why is he associating it with Christian? the Europeans with Christian. Because he wants you to think that all Europeans were Christians and that's not true. Because a lot of the Europeans was pagans. Remember, they were fighting to get them to be Christians because who was really the Christian was the African. All of North Africa was all Christians until the Romans came in and was enslaved them Africans. And then they took on the Christian concept. And then they started calling themselves Christians. All right? So, but when it comes to more, and when you look in this dictionary, they define, historically, they define more as a Berber, a Muslim, a Mohammedan, or an Arab. But they would never want to associate the more with us, 
And if they do associate us with being the more, they use the term black or more. That's what they say. You go in that dictionary, you see more in one page, you go to another reference page, they say black or more. And then when you look at the definition, it's a separate separation. So now wait a minute. Now how did the black or more became more or the more became black or more? But when you look at the definitions between the two, one is giving our Islamic overtone and the other one is dealing with Negro. What is it actually telling you? Are we really interpreting what we see or hear? That's the question. So if we're going to talk about our history, it's very important to recognize language. Language is the key. I, I do review a lot of our Afrocentric scholars from the materials they put out in lectures, books that they produce, all right? But one of the things that I have a problem with, with them is language. Because we have to take time to stress the importance of language. One may say, well, you know, like Garvey, he was trying to get our people to recognize themselves as African. But at the same time, what happened? He couldn't get them to see themselves as African, so he started saying what? He started calling them Negroes. I have to disagree with Garvey. Even himself, he, did, he regretted it. All right? He, he himself. There was a man prior to Marcus Garvey called Nobu Ali. He called our people's Moors. So now, look at the time period that we just came out of bondage, which is chattel on our hands and feet, that is, because today we're still in bondage. Because George M. James had said it clearly, y'all, if you've been reading the book Stolen Legacy, he stated that mental bondage is a visible violence. So again, you say, well, brother, I'm not in bondage. Lincoln said that we was emancipated. But did we ever look up the word emancipation in the etymology dictionary and come to find out that the word emancipate do, do not mean free? That it means to make over or deliver up as property? That Lincoln gave the states bonds to take us out of the state jurisdiction and made us federal citizens under the 14th Amendment? That's the reason why they created the 14th Amendment? And we the only people on this planet that never got the opportunity to say that we wanted to become a U.S. citizen. They just put it on us. Everybody else becomes U.S. Um, US citizen by some immigration process. But we the only people that they put U.S. citizen on us, and we didn't ask to become U.S. citizens. So now you know why we are being subjugated to the crimes that they're perpetrating on us because they feel that we are their property. Do you copy hear what I'm saying? Yeah. So you're wondering why the injustices that's going on. Because again, if you want to study the history, you have to study the language. Because the language is going to unlock truly what they're really saying. When you're in a courtroom and you're listening to what they're talking about, we try to, try to get an understanding of what they're saying, and we don't comprehend what they're saying, because why? We were not skilled or versed in law, something that we were supposed to receive in school. So again, what are we talking about? Again, I stress it again, language. Language is always the key. I'm going to always stress language. You ain't going to never hear nobody stress language like I, like I am. And any time I go to a, a, a lecture, whoever it is, e even in medicine, I can show you something that's astounding. Astounding. The word diabetes. Just look at the history of the word diabetes. Is there such thing as diabetes? The Medical Association came up with that word to make money for the pharmaceutical companies to push what? Insulin to kill your pancreas. Because it says that it helps you to be able to uh, push out with metformin the issue concerning insulin or bring down your blood sugar. This is what they tell you. But when you look up the etymology for the word diabetes, it's a Greek word, meaning to cipher, means to throw off. So guess what, y'all? We all naturally have that. Because one thing that happens to the body when you've been poisoned, you're going to find ways to throw it off. Either you're going to vomit, you're going to have diarrhea, you're going to even do a lot of frequent urination. The purpose of the frequent urination is to throw off the acid. 
Because when I did the research and come to find out that they would say that you got too much ketones built up into your kidneys, spilling over into your blood. So you're, so you're throwing off that. This is what they're telling you. But when you look up ketones and etymology, you come to find out that ketones is acetone. Acetone is what you remove nail polish with. So how do you build up all this acid in your body? You're building it up by eating the, the sugar. The sugar is nothing but acid. The white flour is nothing but acid. We're eating all this acidic foods that's been barred in the liver and been barred in the kidneys, and all of a sudden, what do you need to do? Start doing frequent urination. That's what you start doing. So they call you got diabetes. But they make you look like, think that diabetes is a disease. No, diabetes is not the disease. It means to cipher. It means to throw off. So you have so much concentration of acid in your body, bombardment on your kidneys, that you're automatically throwing it off. That's the reason why they say one of the symptoms of it is dehydration. Of course you're going to be dehydr de being dehydrated if you keep throwing off fluids, keep throwing off fluid. That's just logic. So what you do? Drink alkaline water to neutralize the acids and start eat eating alkaline foods. That's how, you, that's how you kill that noise. If you want to help heal and cure your body from these conditions, that words that they don't want you to use because they got it copyrighted, because once you use the word, they ching ching, they put the cleans on you and rest you because you're using words that only the medical association can, can be the one designated to use that word. But the body technically does the work because really there's nothing out there to really heal you. The most high made the body heal itself. Only thing you're doing is using the herbs to help the body to correct itself. So how are you going to sit up there and say you can copyright something that takes place in nature? How are you going to copy? The body heals itself. The body kills itself. The body treats itself. When the body's been bombarded with so much sugar and acid and it's throwing it off, which they call diabetes, what it's doing is, 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 is treating itself by throwing it off. But if you use the word treatment, all of a sudden they're going to lock you down. Because it's the game they play with the words again. Because they copyright certain words. So if you have a product that would help you, like Cherry, there was a company that put the word treatment for gout and arthritis. So they should have never did that from the cherries. And so the company was shut down because they found that there was something in the cherries that give us this red color that help you from conditions of arthritis and gout. So again, language, analyzing the words, realizing what is it that they're saying, what is it that we're not recognizing? Because they are putting us at a disadvantage because they're using language. So if we want to study the history, language will always have to be at the forefront. What, I don't give a crap what topic it is. It could be medicine. It could be science. It could be history. Whatever topic it is, language would always have to be the key. Unlocking the true mysteries behind what it is it that we really need to know and what, where the, the true origin, not the origin, the true origin, because we, get, we can't be fooled. We have to have critical thinking. Because when they're looking at that dictionary and they say the origin and the history of words, this is what I say to people. Look at the word true origin. Because there's a difference between true origin and origin. Because Latin can be an origin. Hebrew can be an origin. But the question is, is it the true origin of that word? So when you say true origin, then you can start looking deeper and say, oh, you're right like the word Christ. Did you know that the word Christ is an Egyptian word? But yet, in the Bible it says that Egypt is a house of bondage. So if Egypt is a house of bondage, then y'all can't be Christians. Do you hear me what I'm saying? We're not studying the word. Somebody's tricking us. If you're saying that Egypt is a house of bondage, then you can't be Christian because why? The word Christ is an Egyptian word coming from the word Christ. So when you look in the dictionary, look at the word Christ, it says Greek, and it stops right there. So now, come look at the fact that the Greeks came into ancient Egypt, sat at the basis of our ancient ancestors, and studied our language, and they Hellenized all the Greek, the Egyptian words. The ancient comedic words was Hellenized by the Greeks. All the med medical terms, all the mathematical terms, was all Hellenized by the Greeks. 
and Latinized by the Romans. They're taking our language and striving off our language. And you're wondering why we so asphyxiated with them. You know why we asphyxiated with them? It's because when your mother calls you, right, you hear your mother's voice. That's a fact. Any child hears their mother's voice. So when the word that's coming from your mother is spoken and you hear it, you have an affinity with that. What I'm saying to you is the words that we have that they're using that's modified are really our mother tongue. So we, are so, we have so much of an affinity because we hear the root of that word. Even though they modified it and changed it, the very root of the word still go back to the mother. You follow me? And so that's why we so fixated with them because of the fact that they're using our language in a modified form and not realizing that it belongs to us. A lot of the words that we have today, that's Eng matter of fact, the English language is Bantu. The English language that we speak in today, like the word Angola, Angela, Angel, English, Angola. Come on, look at the words. If you start using the linguistic methodology and etymology, you begin to start saying, you know what, he's right. Only thing they did was take a vowel A and put it in the word Angola because they didn't put the vowel in front of the word. It's Angola, in. They just put the A on it to modify the word, and they call it English. But we don't see these things. Because why? Our oppressor is who? Educating us with connotation, with carnal knowledge. It ain't like they're not educating us. They are educating us. But the question is, how are they educating us? And to what? To greed on how they're educating us. They're spoon-feeding us. All right? They're spoon-feeding us. Matter of fact, that's the word that... I stress a lot because let me read the definition of the word spoon fed. Because when you look at the word spoon fed, you will really know what's going on. Spoon fed is the entry word. This is an etymology dictionary, y'all. You can't just go to any regular dictionary. Got to be an etymology dictionary. Definition number three. Listen to what they say here. To treat, instruct, or inform in a manner that destroys initiative or curb independent thought or action. That's the definition of spoon fed. So they're spoon feeding us. And I ain't talking about the spoon that you feed a baby. All right, that's just, that's another one of the definitions. Matter of fact, that's the first definition. I'm looking at the third definition. And that's exactly what they're doing to us. That when they take their language, they're spoon feeding us with their language. To do what? To destroy our independent what? Thought and action. What they mean they're using what? Language again, y'all. They're using language. So how are we going to define history if we don't analyze the language first? This is the reason why I said that if I was to get into any debate with any Eurocentric scholar, or even a Afrocentric scholar, you know what I would use? And I will win every time. And I'm not talking about being braggadocious. I am talking about language. I'm talking about the fact that if you're going to say, well, black Africa, I have to disagree with you, my brother. Whenever, show me historically when there was ever a black Africa. Africa, yes, but you can't use a connotative term called black onto the word Africa. That is incorrect. Go into the African languages and find out the word black, did they ever use the word? That word don't even exist in any language. So how would, why would you use the word black Africa? What you're doing is perpetuating the, the oppression, the language of the oppressor. So we have to correct that. It's just so interesting that when this concept of Ebonics came out, they made a big deal out of it, saying, oh, it's black English. It's a black language. I didn't bring my book with me, but I have a dictionary of psychology by Penguin. And they have in there black English. Can you imagine? The dictionary of psychology have the term black English in the dictionary of psychology. So what are they telling you? But yet we have come out with something that realizing that they already studied it already. They're studying it already. We're taking terms or terminologies thinking that we are making up these terms and they're already ahead of the game. You know why they're ahead of the game? Because we are using their language. But if we go back into our African language, like ma'at, 
You follow me? And Tahuti? You follow me? And Moot? And Newt? When we start using our languages, you know what I'm saying? Like Igwe, you know, those languages, then we're going to free ourselves up. We're going to continue to be in bondage by using the precious language. We're going to continue to be in bondage if we continue to use the precious language. We cannot interpret our history right, our heritage right, or go back into the origin of who we are as a people by using somebody else's language because why? There are limitations to it. How you know it's true? Just look it up in the etymology dictionary. In the etymology brackets. And it say M-E, Middle English. They give you the word. Then you have this mathematical sign, meaning less than, meaning derived from. Then it say O-E, Old English. So they're telling you that what? The Middle English have a limitation on it. They're saying that it's coming from the Old English. Then it goes on to the next one, Old French. What it means? The old, French, the, um, old English has a limitation on it. So you know what that's telling me? They should have dates on those limitations. When, meaning that there was a time period when that word came into existence among them. Prior to that, they didn't have the word. You follow me what I'm saying? Yeah. So if they didn't have the word in that time period, then we cannot take those words to define ourselves. Because when we use those words to define ourselves, then we are putting limitations on us. So Kuji Chakalia, which is the second principle of quanta, was correct by Milana Karenga. It was correct. Because Kuji Ch Chakalia talks about what? Defining oneself or renaming oneself instead of being defined or renamed by who? Others. By others. So Kwanzaa is a correct seventh principle. But unfortunately, it became a black Christmas. Unfortunately, it became a black Christmas. But if we were to stick to the Principles of Kwanzaa, we would be like the Hasidic Jews on a Sabbath day. Yeah. I'm going to say it again. If we would have stuck to the seven principles, the true seven principles of Kwanzaa, we would be like a Jew on a, a Hasidic Jew on a Sabbath day. Because one thing I can say as a, as, a, as a young man, back in the 70s, right? And I'm not looking at the word in a connotative sense, but I'm looking at the movement. Even though it was connotative, but it was the movement. We used to have, if we can remember, Black Solidarity Day. That's right. Do you remember that, y'all? Yes. There was a time that we didn't go nowhere. We didn't go to no stores. I remember that. That was our Sabbath at the time. But we got away from that. Because somebody else is controlling our economy. And until we control our own economy with our own language, we're going to continue to suffer as a people. We're going to continue to suffer as a people. Again, I stress language. I oppose language to our Afrocentric scholars. They're doing a beautiful job. I'm not taking away from none of them because they are unfolding our culture at a level of degree that we never had before because the European is not going to do it, and I don't expect them to do it. And matter of fact, I don't, I don't even like the fact that they're doing it because when they do it, they're going to distort it. So it's beautiful that we got brothers and sisters who's into that forum and divulging that high culture to us as a people. But at the same time, language has to be the key. Because we can't use European language to define African history. Do you hear me what I'm telling you, y'all? We cannot define African history with a European language. So what I'm saying is that our brothers and sisters who is Afrocentric need to start studying language so that we can truly liberate our people. Because you can't define an African history with European language. Because the European language is a language of, of oppression. Have you ever heard of the word equivocal? Equivocal is what the English language represents. It's the language of being deceptive. It's connotative. It's ambiguous. Have you seen the movie Amistad? When they thought they won the case, and he came back and said to St. Q, we almost won. So he told the interpreter, tell him, we almost won. The interpreter you know, hesitated. Because there's no such word. So he kept saying to him, well, why are you not telling him almost? He says, because there's no such thing as almost. Either you do or you don't. That was awesome. That's awesome. That is awesome. I picked that up. I picked that up when he said that. That's language again. We're too busy looking at entertainment. We forgot the language.
Matter of fact, let me show you something else again. John 1 and 1, good example. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. You know what's wrong with that? And no pastors who went to theological schools and getting their degrees in theology have picked it up. There was something wrong with John 1 and 1. If you tell me that our creator is omniscient, omnipresent, omnipresent you cannot use the word was. Because was is a what? Past verb. You cannot use the word was when it comes to God. You have to use a word that describes his omnipresence. And was is not an omnipresent term. It's a past verb. So you can't say in the beginning was the word. Because that's like saying the word ain't no more. That's what you're saying? Right, right, right. So why is it that we got caught up with that? It's because the pastors, the ministers, the elders, the deacons, we are studying European languages again. That's that almost. He was almost the creator, but he was. <laughs> you follow me what I'm saying? And we're not picking that up. We're not picking that up, family. We are not picking that up. This is a book called Jim Crow's Children by Peter Irons. And you'll be surprised the information that's in this book. Because again, they talk about Brown versus the Board of Education, which we all very familiar with. He shows you in this book, it's still going on. It's still going on. It's still going on. And we have a lot of our people knocking the charter schools. I say the charter schools was the best thing that ever happened to us. A lot of our people is knocking the charter schools, but they don't know what's going on. The charter schools give us an opportunity to have an African curriculum because their department was so much in control that they attacked it Leonard Jeffries. When he was talking about bringing in the curriculum to help our people, what did they do? Ran him out of City College and almost tried to take his life. Him and his wife, Rosalind Jeffries. So a charter school is the best thing because why? Now we can control it. You know what the problem is? We don't comprehend finance. We need to begin to start knowing how to structure a charter school, get the funding from the federal government and the state government and the county government that we can start putting together an African curriculum in our own charter schools. The Jews doing it every Sabbath day for their children, and they don't have a problem with the school system, but at the same time, let it be a Rosh Hashanah, it's going to be shut down. So again, if they're controlling their education, why are we not controlling it? To me, the Board of Education has been controlling our education for so long, it need a change. But then we have those who would disagree, listen, we had the Board of Education going back into the 1800s. In the 1800s, the Board of Education was going back in there. Webster was the first one to make the change. Do you, do you feel me what I'm saying? Webster was the first one that rebelled against the British crown because he did not want the English customs and usage of the British syntax to be used among American children. This is what Webster was against. And so we don't have our teachers doing what Webster did. We got brothers and sisters who got licenses from the state that has qualifications to even put together a dictionary, and we haven't done that yet. We're still picking up the European dictionary, and we're not even putting one together for ourselves. And if you ask any English-speaking teacher, let's talk about etymology, they lost, but they got a master's degree. And I'm not saying it's to a slay the hand on them to make them look bad, but that just tells you who's controlling that's what that's, talk, that's, talk, that's what that's talking about. Who is control? Again, they're using their language against us. We're not structuring nothing for ourselves. We're going to always continue to be entrapped with somebody else's language. I give you a good example. I give you a good example for those who's driving. If you get a parking, a driving, a um, traffic ticket, we're going to use language. How many of us know the definition of traffic? We don't. 
But we're steady getting the traffic ticket from the officer who stops us. But when you go to the Black's Law Dictionary and look up what? Traffic, it means commerce. That's what the word traffic means. So if you're driving, do you got a commercial license and a commercial plate on your car? No. So how are you getting a traffic ticket? Because you don't know language. They know you don't know the language. So what do we do? Take the ticket, go to the place, make the payment. And do the same thing over and over again, over and over again. So your hard-earned money that you're working for, you keep paying these robbers, these extortioners. Do you hear me what I'm telling you? Why? Because we don't know the language. I can demonstrate language all night for you to let you know what I'm talking about. Because once you know the language, it becomes very liberating. I don't need to get a lawyer. You need the language. Once you know the language, you're free. Now, if we knew the language, we would have found out that the word emancipate don't mean free. We didn't know the language. So we see these movies that they make in Hollywood. You know who's that to be controlled by? Right. Turn around and say, oh, we are free. We, we've been emancipated by who? Lincoln. President Lincoln trying to come out with the Emancipation Proclamation. We are free. We are free. What are you talking about? The word emancipate means to make over, deliver up as property. So only thing that Lincoln did under martial law was take you away from the state and put you under federal control. So look at the 14th Amendment. All persons born or naturalized is subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. That, that, so you what? Your federal property re residing in the state. So again, what are we talking about? We're talking about language again. We're talking about language. So. If we're going to stress our history, and we're going to stress law, we're going to stress medicine, we're going to stress math, language is the key, y'all. I'll be the first one to talk about language, because once I put this knowledge in your head about it, then you're going to see things differently. Matter of fact, the word etymology is not an academic subject. It's not an academic subject. Etymology is a divine faculty, y'all. Do you hear me when I'm telling you? I've been around etymologists, and neither one of them have said that. I have etymology books, and none of them have said what I said. Etymology is a divine faculty. It has to be invoked. That's your Tahuti principle. That's what etymology is. It's a Tahuti faculty. So it's important to know that, that it's innate in us. It's already there already. It's in our DNA. We have to invoke what's already there already. And then unfortunately, we are invoking the wrong things. We are invoking carnal knowledge as opposed to true knowledge. That's what we invoke in. And we are invoking this kind of knowledge in every facet of our life, starting with religion. Starting with religion. Because one thing that John Henry Clark said, but I studied well on our Afrocentric scholars. I studied well. I was a little one, and I was right among them. I was sitting at their feet. One thing he said, they colonized our God concept. Yes, that's, that's what John Henry Clark, our Shea, our ancestor said. So I said, wow. So now the question is, how did they colonize our God concept? But I know they oppressed us from it, oppressed us away from our own concepts, and, it, and how they put it upon us. By using language. Because we are using words that's of English syntax that's not African in origin. And how I know this is because I got brothers who are Baba Laos. And they say that the forces of the ancestors that when they started invoking, they used Yoruba terminology, which is more powerful than using it in English. Because our ancestors can hear you, and it's true. Because if you know your mother's voice, and you hear somebody else's call with your mother's uh, uh, some makeup or whatever, the first thing you're going to say is, that person looked like my mother, but she don't sound like my mother. You follow me? That person may look like my mother from afar. She could be dressed up like your mother and, it, and call out your name, their child. And you say, wow, from afar, that looks like my mother. But it doesn't sound like my mother. And that's, not, and that's not what we're saying as a people. Because we have been so highly poisoned 
and enculturated with the poison to a point where we can't even hear. So it makes sense when you say, those who got a, hear, a ear cannot hear, and those who got eyes cannot see, and those who have a heart cannot perceive, because they had poisoned our hearts, poisoned our ears, and our eyes, and our minds. So it makes sense why George G.M. James says, mental bondage is invisible violence. Because what they did, brothers and sisters, the new chattel slavery that's going on, the new chattel slavery, because I have never heard no Afrocentric scholar talk about it. The new child of slavery is not on your hands and feet. It's on your mind. Yes, By paper. When you go into a black ball dictionary, look at the word shadow paper. It says commerce. So again, what is your child of paper? The birth certificate is your child of paper. The marriage license is your child of paper. Because if you go again to Exodus, the 20th, Chapter, 21st chapter, excuse me, verse 1 through 6, it says that if he gets, if, if, if his wife has been given to him by his master and he bears sons and daughters of his wife, then his wife and his children belong to his master. I said, wait a minute, that's interesting. Because when a man gets married in the state, we as more say, well, what do the marriage certificate have to play the role between the relationship between the man and woman when it comes to intercourse. Because of the fact of the marriage license, which is an adhesion contract, and also the birth certificate, which is another adhesion contract, gives the state the authority to run in there and snatch your children. It's the birth certificate that's giving them the authority. But we don't see that, because that's the chattel paper. Again, what are they using? Language. Language, y'all. That's what they're using. So I want to always stress that language is the key. Next week, I want to get more into giving an outline of the religious facet and how that religious facet came down today as the civil law. That's important. I'm going to bring other materials so that way we can see it. Because, again, in my law classes, I teach that criminal law comes from civil law and civil law comes from ecclesiastical law. And I have the materials and I will bring them down and I'm going to show you something that's astonishing. So if you can come out next week, Thursday, I will have the materials to show you something that you can even fathom that's still going on today. You know, and it's incredible. I'm, I'm still flabbergasted from the information that I go into and I study because of why? Language. Because the word read means to interpret. So when you look at something and I'm interpreting what I'm reading, I say, oh my goodness, I can't believe what I'm seeing, what I'm reading. Because they're telling you one thing and I see another. For instance, Homeland Security. How many of us really recognize the definition or the meaning of Homeland Security? Do we know that Homeland Security is referring to finances and not military uh, uh, personnel guarding the borders? It have nothing to do with military um, 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 personnel guarding the borders. Homeland Security is talking about finances, y'all, and I can prove it. Because when I traveled to Chicago to do a lecture, and I went there twice, I didn't have no state ID, and I had no U.S. passport. What I used is Social Security card and a credit card and a piece of mail. This is what I used. So what is that telling you? No state ID and no federal passport. Because state ID is in the 14th Amendment, you know. And U.S. passport is in the 14th Amendment. If you go to the 14th Amendment, it tells you right in there. Citizens, you're a citizen within the United States and the state that where you reside. If you're born in the United States, you're a citizen in the United States and the state where you reside. So what proof of that to show you that you're a citizen in the state where you reside in the United States? Passport and state ID. You follow me what I'm saying, y'all? Yeah. And I didn't need none of those when I traveled. Because they're talking about finance. That's what they're talking about. Any questions? Um, maybe you could touch on just a little bit, if you can. Yes. Uh, how the religious 
law, uh, how the church, mm -hmm. um, how the system of the church was the law of the land. Wow. And how that law is the same, uh, uh, how it was transferred. All right. Um, I'm going to give you a, a brief synopsis on it, but I have to bring my references in because the reference points are so important because what I will say, it would be hard to fathom because it's unbelievable. What are you talking about is the Papal Bull. The Papal Bull, Papal is referring to the Pope, y'all, so you'll know what I'm talking about. The Bull is referring to a decree. You follow me? And what happened was, this happened with the Moors, all right? The Crusade War happened with the Moors. Who were known as the Moors? We was known as the Moors in history because there was different eras in time of history as we as a people was known under different African names. And so the last greatness of our people as an empire, we was known as Moors, all right? Prior to that, we was known as Etruscans, we was known as um, um, Carthaginians under Hannibal. So we had different names in different times, and we are all the same people, all right? So that's something that we need to recognize because we as a people have a tendency to fight. We ain't this, we that. We, that, that was all of us as a people. You know, like uh, Walter Rock, um, Williams had said one time as I was analyzing a, a DVD of his when it was asked of you, Minister Brown, you know, well, who is these Sumerians or Canaanites or, he said, these are African people, and that's true. So again, the Papa Bull is a decree from the Pope that was handed down to the sovereigns of Europe to come against us as a people, all right? That's where the downfall came. Two books that you can read, and there's other references, is the story of the Moors of Spain by Stanley Lane Poole and the Moors after Spain. There are some questions about this human trafficking at a large degree as has been put out there. And you say, what do you mean by that? Because when you study the history, you come to find out that the 15, 16, 17, and 18, even up to the 19th century, Moors have been taking contribution from European nations. All right? They, we was taking contribution. They had to pay us to pass over the other side, and if not, we would actually confiscate that ship. We did that under what you call is maritime jurisdiction, merchant law, admiralty, law. That's what we did. But that was a way to get back our wealth because these Europeans have stolen a lot of our wealth through a religious war, all right, which is called the Papa Bull. The bull, so you all know what's going on, is a symbolic of the Moors. In Spain, you have a ceremony called what? The running of the bulls. Now, there is a cape. Do anybody know what the color of the cape when they fly to the bull? Amen. Listen to what I'm saying carefully. That is the Moorish flag. If you see the Moorish flag, it's a red flag. So what is that telling you? That they would take the red flag and use it as a cape to have that bull to charge at them. And then they would turn around and take the sword, and they killed the bull, all right? This is actually a ceremony that they have in Spain in reference to the running of the bulls, which is symbolic of the Moors. The bulls go back to Egypt. It's called Apis. That's what it's called, Apis. So again, a lot of the ritual that we see, the Romans have picked up those rituals, all right? And there was wars, and it started with the Crusades. And who was in the crusade was the Moors, all right, which was us against the Roman papacy, all right? And so from that time, they started fighting us all the way down to Queen Ferdinand and Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand. That was the marking of their 1492, all right? Because it's interesting that we are here that in 1492, Christopher Columbus discovered America. But now the question is, what status or nationality that we had in 1492. There was no Negroes in 1492. There was no blacks in 1492. There were no coloreds in 1492. Ask any brothers and sisters from the Caribbean island. In 1492, was there Trinidad? 
1492 were there in Jamaica. Do you follow me what I'm saying? Right. Were those Caribbean islands existed? Yes, they had indigenous names. They had indigenous names, and those names is lost. Matter of fact, one of my greatest heroes, right, and they think it's um, in the Haitian Revolution, it's two of them. One is Dessaline, right? Who's the other one? Toussaint Overshore, right? Well, who do you think is the real hero in the Haitian Revolution? It's not, it's not Overshore. It's Dessaline. Dessaline was the one who named it Haiti. It was called Hispaniola. Under the Spaniards. But when he fought, because it was the French in there, the Spanish was in there, and the British was in there. I mean the French, excuse me. The Spanish and the French was in there. And they was fighting real hard, even to a point where even the British was coming in there. But who named it, its indigenous name, was Dessaline. He was the one who named Haiti, Haiti. He kept it to the indigenous name. And this is something that we need to know. So again, when we begin to start looking at our history, we begin to start realizing that these terms or these words were not used in 1492. So what, what we was known as at that particular time, we were known as Moors. That's what we were known as. Yes. That's what we was known as, as Moors. All right. Unfortunately, and I'll be the first to say, because I, I declare myself as a Moor, all right, because I'm not Negro, I'm not black, and I'm not colored. All right, those are the terms that delude to slavery. And I'd also be the first one to say that it's unfortunately that a lot of our Moorish brothers and sisters out there are not pushing out the right information. All right? And this Moorish movement is supposed to be a movement where we were supposed to help liberate our brothers and sisters by declaring what? Our nationality and our birthright. Our birthright sisters were stolen from us. You know where our birthright was stolen at? And the sisters need to know this. Get the Black's Law Dictionary and look at the word delivery. Because it takes place in the delivery room. It takes place in the delivery room. What dictionary is that? Black's Law Dictionary. And look at the word delivery. By who? Black's Law. Henry Campbell Black is his full name. But they just use Black, you know, to indicate it was him that put those legal terms together. Henry Campbell Black was his name. But they call it Black's Law. So you know. So what I'm saying is when you look up the word delivery, look up the word res, R-E-S. That means thing in civil law. So what they did was they took your property from you constructively and handed it over to the state, not knowing it, through what? Chattel paper. Because when you fill out what you call is a certificate of live birth and return the state will send you back what? A birth certificate, correct, y'all? Right. That is no different than when you go to a car dealer and to get a brand new car, the dealer sends to the state what you call is a manufacturer certificate of origin, and in return they send you what you call is what? A certificate of title. Not the title. That's incorrect, y'all, because again, and I'm not here to embarrass nobody because I stress language, because, and, and I demonstrate this for those who know English well as an English teacher. And I, like I said, I need a board to demonstrate it. Because if you say title, I have to put down certificate of title. The preposition in that is what? What is the other variant of the word of? From. Correct? The other variant of the word of is, come on, y'all, from. So now read it. Remove of and put from and say certificate what? Come on, y'all. Do you hear what I'm saying? Do you catch me what I'm saying? I'm talking about language again, y'all. So they'll get you to think that, oh, this is the title to my car. This is the title to my, no, that's not true. They're using language again. Didn't I just say earlier that English is an equivocal language? It's equivocal. It's a deceptive language. It's an ambiguous language. So when you see the words certificate of, of means from. It's, so it's a certificate from the title. From something doesn't mean that it, it is that thing, that res. So the certificate is reflecting 
What's it coming from? The original. Thank you. And what gave them that authority is the manufacturer's certificate of origin. Th that is the original title. Once you have that, that shows you that you truly have your car. That's the reason why the police officers can pull you to the side because that's state property. Because it has the name of the state over it. That's right. So you have cloud title. You don't have clear title. Clear title means you would have the original. But if you have the certificate of the original, that's cloud title. Do you hear me what I'm saying? So again, we're talking about what? Language. So again, back to the Papa Bull was a decree that was passed from the papyracy against African people, which we was known as Moors. All right? This is what happened. It was a religious war that went on. All right? And so again, the papyracy had expanded their decree so far that it went so far west that it came into a place where we know today as the Americas. And how they got to travel over here was through the trade routes that Moors had set up, going back and forth on ships. This is the reason why we had the power to tax them, which is where we get the word Tariq. Tariq gives the birth or to the term traffic, a tariff. You follow me? which is a form of tribute or taxation. So it's something that we need to know, again, in language. So we're going to always define language in the light of whatever subject matter or topic we're talking about. It's very important. So where our downfall happened was the religious sector. But then what happened was, after they created the religious sector as a decree, then they conformed the religious sector by changing it into what you call is a civil government. That's what they did. They created it into a civil government. Because again, the clerk's office, when you go to the clerk's office or the county office and you go to the clerk's office, the clerk office is the who? And the, and the religious factor, the clergy. Because remember, they had the birth certificates and the marriage license was all in the what? Church. So how is it that they shifted it from the church into the county register? Now you can go to City Hall and pull your marriage license or your birth certificate when it was held in your Bible through your church. So now the clergy of your church became the clerk of City Hall. So they shifted the religious factor over to a civil government. So now I can impose the question since I defined it for you. Is church and state separate? No, no. Thank you. Exactly. But I had to define the language for you again, because I'm stressing language, to order to put that out there to you. So now, because you can analyze it with critical thinking, you can say no. But if I were to ask you that question prior to me giving you that critical analysis, 1910, you probably would have said, yes, there's a separation between church and state, because that's what we was told. Any questions? Yes, that's correct. Both the House and, and the Senate. Senate. I'm, I'm aware of that. And they pray. That's right. For each session. That's true. So again, uh, where is there a separation of church and state? And anybody can walk through that door through the process and can stand pray. The, the, the New Age people. That's correct. The Christians, whatever the faith. That's correct. And it's interesting that you said that because. When the president is being elected to be president and he's sworn in, what ceremony is that called, y'all? Inauguration. inauguration. Yes. Do you know that when you go do the etymology on the word inauguration, that means augury? Did you know that? It means augury? And do you know what augury is? Witchcraft and sorcery and divination. Hmm. And who they need for that? The priests. So the, pr the president swearing in is based upon witchcraft. So it's interesting that you're saying that. So there's a reason why they're there. So I can 100% agree with you because I study etymology to bring me to that light. Inauguration is augury. Augury is witchcraft, divination, and sorcery. 
So that's something serious, y'all. Sure. Yes. Um, uh, the church. The church. Yes. Okay. The position of the church. Now, we talk about um, the, the, like Solomon, the days of Solomon. All right. Okay. But he ruled it was a theocracy. All right. Okay. So, today the church goes to the government as opposed to the, the, uh, the government coming to the church. True. So, the church is ruled by the government. So, how can church truly be you know a, a, a vehicle a vessel you know for god to use to deliver the people and how do we say to the nation um let my people go today relinquish control with all this information that you have mm -hmm. breaking down detail you know word by word letter by letter all right um you know which brings us to our children in the public school system there you go them to devil. there you go sis and, uh, where are the our, our black men to go into the school system all right. and to teach these children. I look at on 125th Street, they have all the brothers out there on the street with this kind of information that needs to be in the school system. True. We talk about some active activism. That's so true. That is true. You're right, sis. You want to say correct. And your question again, so I could be. You're making a statement, or oh, that's the question? Yeah, both. Uh, how do we get our blessing into the forward school system? How do we deliver, you know, to the, to the, to the government? All right. To the, the uh, 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 top of the government to let my people go. You know, we thought today is the moment. You know, when it's okay to let my people go, but it seems like there's a need today to tell Pharaoh, let my people go, we leave this control. Well, it's interesting that you said it, and, and I'm going to make this your last question, and I'm going to close this out with the fact that the theocracy didn't come from Solomon. It came from what you call as the pharaonic dynasties from ancient Egypt. Um, that's where the true um, theocracy came from. It was passed down um, to the Hebrews, all right, to the Greeks, to the Romans, and to Europe, and England's being a monarch because you got the king and the queen, all right? So in England, is also a church, like the Church of England, all right? It's not, you know, it's, it's a religious government. You see what I'm saying? And this is how they assimilated to split the civil side of the theocracy, you know, where it looked like if though there is a separation between church and state, and it's not. But as far as our brothers in, um, into the school system, we as a people have to take the initiative to educate our brothers Education is really going to be the key, sis. Exactly. Education and economics. Exactly. Those two is the key. Exactly. Because if you don't teach them to feed themselves, they're going to do drugs exactly. or sell drugs. Yeah. So economics, we have to financially educate them in economics and education. Those are the two factors that's going to help liberate our brothers and sisters. And you have talked about what reparations is. For the first time, all we get is... Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm working on a dictionary too. Exactly. So it's interesting that you're saying that. Yeah. How do we change our name without changing it? How do we change the name of the state? I can show you how to do that. Uh, I can show you how to do that. And then how do we take the slave data and take it back? I can, I can show you how to do that too. I can show you that. I can show you how to do that too. Let's do that. Exactly. Let's give brother Matthew a hand. Thank you so much. All the time. We got to do one more thing. Now, next week, bring somebody with you. True. Because you ha we have to understand um, how it is that we are enslaved. You know, from from law. True. How how the law is. Because 
we really haven't seen the whole picture. And Brother Kometi, you next week will be looking at how the how the how the laws of England, how the whole system, English system, was just transferred here. But he's going to look at, he's going to be dealing with search. He's going to de be dealing with the whole system. Because you have to understand that whole certain sy system uh, in order to understand how the English from the beginning came here. Uh, but they knew what they were doing. I mean, they sent, they sent military men here to conquer this land. True. And how... You know, we look at a county. What is a county? You know, why is it a county? Uh, but these were the lands that were given uh, under the generals that came to conquer those lands. True. I mean, to conquer America. True. So they became the governors and so forth. So he's going to break the whole thing down to us next week. That's true. So bring someone so that we can uh, uh, look at this history. Because most of our lives, we have led the world, and we've been in charge of. True. And all knowledge came into the world through us. It's only a short period of time that Europeans have been in charge of anything, a very short period of time. And the only way, reason we stay oppressed is the lack of knowledge. True. We want to take up a quick uh, collection now. Um, I know it's only a handful of us, but we do have to pay for the place. And that's all I'm asking tonight that we do, is right. just pay for the place. So who can help us out? Anybody can give us $50 uh, tonight, uh, can make a donation of $50. Uh, here's 10 I got 10 uh, I want to raise a little more than 50 but I mean, I, I was hoping somebody would start us out with 50 OK. Um, Anybody else can give us uh, 20? Anybody can do a $20 donation? Anybody? Okay, let's deal with these 10s then. Uh, hopefully everybody can give us a 10. We can be out of here. Thank you, Sister Ali McLean. Yes. Yes. All right. I think I can put the rest to it. 